morning. morning. I'm sorry we have to fiddle with the lights. They changed all the bulbs out uh, to fluorescence to save money, but you can't dim them. So we either have it like super bright or a little bit dark. So if you want to sleep, you have to sit on this side. If you want to stay awake, you have to sit over here. But we're glad you're here this morning. We're going to talk about a subject that I do not enjoy talking about other than how we receive forgiveness from God. But giving forgiveness is one of the hardest things in life. We're continuing our uh, relationship series and renewal, the idea of renewal and renewing relationship series. And this is one of the keys, the big keys in relationships. Forgiveness. And the reason it's such a big deal is because we all blow it and we all mess up and we all are flawed and we make mistakes. But just like that video sometimes, the truth is, sometimes instead of forgiveness, we want revenge. Now, revenge is different than justice. Justice is getting what's right. Revenge is kind of that extra little knife turn. Uh, You can tell if you have a revenge issue, if when you talk about a person, you tend to kind of grit your teeth or that, you know, or or, or like your mom's when you got in trouble in junior high, your eye twitches just a little bit, right? So the idea of forgiveness and the idea of vengeance kind of go hand in hand. hand. Number one movie this weekend is all about that. It's called Avengers. It's the idea of setting something right. And if you're like me, you love it when the Incredible Hulk in the last movie, uh, uh, the enemy Thor, or not Thor, the, the bad guy, Loki I think is who it was, or somebody. And you love it when he was trying to talk Hulk out of beating him up and Hulk just picked him up and started swinging them around, and you went, yeah, that's awesome, because there's something in us that loves it when evil's just punished, and you do something wrong, and man, it's good. It's, we like the video where the guy passes, he's, he's tailgating that lady, and then he passes her, and then his car wipes out into the median, and we go, wow, that's awesome, that's the way it should be. But it doesn't help us when we have that attitude. You know, years ago when I was in seminary, I had a friend who's a pastor, his name's Paul Thompson, you can look him up online. And my mom encourages me not to use names. Paul, P-A-U-L, Thompson. And he's actually a good friend of mine, so it's all right. I can harass him a little bit. He's pastor of a big old church, I believe, in South Carolina now. But nobody listens to you, Paul, so it doesn't really matter where you're pastoring. Anyway, Paul was in my class in seminary and uh, um, when I was working on my master's degree through New Orleans Seminary. And we all had friends. We would go to dinner together every week, and those are some of my... Uh, greatest friends from school. And so uh, I'll never forget one week we had an exam. And when you had an exam, they'd give you like a half hour to an hour sometimes break. And so they had started teaching, they had taught or whatever they were teaching on. And then um, I had back then in the old days, we used to carry these things called briefcases. And uh, now they just carry backpacks. Well, we used to carry briefcases. And so I had one of those briefcases that had a six combination lock and so when I went to get my snack, I left my briefcase on my coat and left it open. Didn't think a thing about it. When I came back to get my notes out to study, my briefcase was locked. Not only was it locked, somebody changed the code. To which one of Paul's friends instantly sold, sold him out and said, It was Paul Thompson who did that to you. Paul was out getting a snack at this time, and the room was relatively empty. So this is where ADD comes in handy, I must admit. Because you create it, you think creatively. So you think, hey, if I was going to lock somebody's briefcase, I wouldn't want them to not be able to get in because I'm their friend. I would probably put them in. So I went 000, 111, 222, 333, you know, all the numbers. Boom, opened my briefcase. And I went, yeah. And then I thought, I wonder if Paul left his briefcase unlocked. Hmm. So I walked over to Paul's briefcase, and I went like this, click, and both things just popped right up, and I went, (laughs) (laughs) So I changed Paul's briefcase number to my social security number. Yes, well, I could remember it. I didn't care if he couldn't. And and then I locked his briefcase. Now, he was out of the room until right before the exam. He came in, he sat down on the left. My briefcase was now closed exactly where I left it, but I had my notes now, which is all I really cared about. I just needed to study, and I'm really good at cramming, so that's what I was doing, like most students. So, but I could see Paul and two of his friends, who were my friends too, over here on the left. We sat kind of in a horseshoe. So the professor said, 
All right, it's time to put your things away. Get out a pencil or pen and a piece of paper. And I could see Paul over there elbowing the guys next to him and going, watch this. I could see it out of the corner of my eye. And I was trying not to look over there, but I could see him going, watch this, watch this. Here's what I did. I reached up for my briefcase. I popped both sides and it went instantly, bloop, opened it and looked right at Paul. <laughs> to which he went, oh. now I don't know what was going through his head. Maybe he thought I was a magician. Maybe he thought that he didn't lock it right. But he knew that I knew that he had messed with my, brief, with his, with my briefcase. So he is like, well, how did you do that? And then Paul looks at me like, oh no. <laughs> He reaches down for his briefcase, goes to, and there's nothing. So I know what he did. He did what I did. And he thought, well, that Eric, I'm sure he's been nice and done zero, 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 one, one. So Paul starts, one, one, two, 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 three, three. And the professor's now saying, now, Paul, you need to put your things away. And Paul's going, <laughs> How's it going, Paul? And I let him sweat just a, I got to admit, felt really good. Felt really good. So I waited a couple minutes and then I signed my social security number to which he opened 30 credit cards later. No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I signed, and he, he put it, and later he's like, how in the world did you do that? And I told him the whole story. I gotta admit, it felt really good to have somebody try to trick you. Now that's a joke, obviously, and we were messing around, but it's awesome, isn't it? Don't you love a story like that where somebody kind of gets even? I, I think that's the reason we love professional wrestling some of us because when we were kids you know dusty Rhodes would be up there and he'd be fighting and he'd be fighting fair and all of a sudden the bad guy you know the referee would be distracted which i've always wondered how in the world but anyway the referee would be chasing a butterfly or something and the bad guy would throw dirt in his eye or hit him with a chair or punch him in the back of the head or three guys would jump on him while the referee was picking up something off the floor and all of a sudden you turn back around and now he's falling and faltering and you're, and you're saying, how could somebody be so evil? How could they hurt Dusty Rhodes? He's such a good guy and he invented the Dusty Rhodes. How could you not like him? And he's the all-American guy and you know, all this stuff and... All of a sudden, what would happen is Dusty Rhodes would start getting beat up, and he'd almost be falling, and he'd be down, and they'd count to two and a half, and then they, you know, he'd get up, and he was fall, and then all of a sudden, something happened. I don't know if the guy said something about his mother, or what happened, and all of a sudden, you'd see Dusty Rhodes, he'd get that face, and you're like, oh, and now Hulk Hogan used to do the same thing. You remember Hulk Hogan, all of a sudden, would go, and I think that was a Slim Jim. Uh, anyway, so... And then what would happen? They would come back, and, and as individuals, we're like, that's the way it should be. When something unfair is done, somehow we need to get even. Everything needs to come back into place. And it's that sense of justice that can also go awry and become vengeance. And that's what happens in unforgiveness. Listen, wouldn't you like your life to be more full of joy and more full of peace? Wouldn't you like when you pray to be able to hear God's voice more clearly so as you go through life, you just be really sensitive to Him? I believe that forgiveness, if not the main key, is one of the main keys to really knowing God and walking in peace and joy. Even non-Christians know that this is important. Research has shown that unforgiven and unforgiving people have higher rates of stress, cardiovascular disease, clinical depression, lower immune system function, and higher divorce rates. We know that unforgiveness and not forgiving other people impacts us. Science is showing this, and so even people who aren't Christians, but here's the big deal. If you're a believer, forgiveness is a bigger deal than how it helps you. It's recognizing that you have a God who loves you so much that he forgave you. And if you're a Christian, it's understanding that he so poured his love and his forgiveness into you and his forgiveness into me that we have no choice but to say, how can I hold anything against somebody else when I've been given so much forgiveness? So today we're going to look at three keys to better relationships through forgiveness. I love what Lily Tomlin says. She says, to forgive is to give up all hope of a better past. 
Sometimes we look back and we wish things were different. We look back and we think, how could we get even with that person? Or what that person did was wrong. And we try to relive that over and over. And if we're not careful, we rehearse the past. And sometimes what we do is we just continue to walk in the pain. By the way, although vengeance feels good, psychologists are also realizing that although it feels good for a moment, it's actually worse for us over time. So what does Romans 3 say? Here's the first thing we need to do. If you and I are going to walk in forgiveness, the first thing we need to do is receive God's forgiveness. Receive God's forgiveness. Romans 3, 21 to 24 from the New Century Version. But God has a way to make people right with him without the law. I'm so thankful for that, by the way, because the law includes you can't have bacon. Did you know that? It also includes you can't have shrimp. Did you know that? No bacon, no shrimp. So you can't have bacon-wrapped shrimp. I mean, it's awful, okay? But not only that, you would have to keep the whole law. And they even knew in the Old Testament that even if they kept the whole law, they still needed a sacrifice. So every year or more, they would actually sacrifice. And the high priest, once a year, would go and sacrifice as a way of foreshadowing what Jesus was going to do. So God has a way of making people right with him without the law. And he has now shown us that way which the law and the prophets told us about. Even in Isaiah, you can read about the Savior who would come. Even when you look in the Old Testament, you can see about the Savior that would come. The Jewish people were looking forward to the Messiah who would pay for their sins. God makes people right through himself. How? Through their faith in Jesus Christ. Everybody, every once in a while, somebody will say to me, is that the only way to God? Eric, I think there's a lot of different religions. I think it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. I think all these things. The Bible says, and Jesus himself said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's not my rules. I'm not the one that said it. Jesus is the one who said it. And all through Scripture, it reminds us that Jesus is the way to God. And then it says, this is true for all who believe in Christ because all people are the same. Everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glorious standard and all need to be made right. That's the word innocent with God. By his grace, which is a free gift. They need to be made free from sin through Jesus Christ. It's a free gift. We don't try to earn it. It's not because of your works. It's not because you do enough good stuff that God forgives you. He forgives you because he loves you. Now, I love my sister Kelly. My sister Kelly and I have been friends. Uh, uh, we've always gotten along pretty well. We very rarely fought. Um, we had the flu together. One of her best memories is we both had the stomach flu together one night, and we stayed up all night taking turns throwing up. She remembers that pleasantly. I don't. But anyway, my sister Kelly has 10 children. So let me try that again. My sister Kelly has 10 children. Wow. Wow, cool, awesome. Okay, good. All right. So my sister Kelly has 10 children. I would love it. I would love it if somehow I could take all of them to Disney World one day. Put them up in a hotel at the Grand Floridian, which is a billion dollars a night there at Disney. Take, take the tram right from the hotel. Take them to Disney. Give them unlimited food and go around all. You can imagine that would cost thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Now, if we were doing that and her kids were having an awesome time and they were praising the name of Uncle Eric, praise the name of Uncle Eric, which I prefer them to do anyway. They, they tend to watch my sermons every week. I expect notes of praise to come my way. Anyway, so, I'm just kidding. So, if I took them there and then all of a sudden my sister looked at me and she said, Eric, I don't have money to pay you. Oh, wait, wait, I got 10 bucks. Here's 10 bucks to help with the cost of today. After yelling at my sister, right, I would say, what are you, crazy? Do you have any idea what this costs? Listen, so many of us go to God and we think that somehow we're going to earn his love. And somehow if we blow it and we mess up, we've got to somehow earn our way back to him. Listen, he loves you enough that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, for you and for me. That's the reason that we want to do what he wants us to do. The reason that we obey his command, Jesus said, is because we love him. 
Not because we're trying to earn our way to him. Receive his forgiveness. Did you know the gospel? And if you go to a traditional church this morning, they will say the gospel. Today we're going to talk about the gospel. <laughs> okay? And the gospel, it simply means good news. Did you know the Bible is good news? By the look of most Christians' faces, you could not tell that. It's good news. It's not bad news. It's the idea that you cannot measure up. You can't do enough. You can't get it right. Now, that's the bad news. But the good news is you don't have to. You receive God's forgiveness through faith. You accept Jesus Christ, His Son, and the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that He gave for you and for me. When we do that, we begin to already experience peace when we receive His forgiveness. We begin to experience joy because we've received His forgiveness. And Isaiah says it this way. The Lord says, come, let us talk about these things. Though your sins are like scarlet, they can be white as snow. Though your sins are deep red, they can be white like wool. Even in the Old Testament, it talked about how Christ was going to wipe away our sins. Now, here's your first prayer step. Have you received God's forgiveness? Do you think God doesn't quite love you? Do you feel sometimes like you don't quite measure up? What you're saying is, God, your grace isn't good enough for me. I'm too messed up. I'm too broken. Yeah, I can't receive. Listen, receive his grace, not because you've done anything, not because you're smart enough, not because you've straightened your whole act out and you have everything right. Receive his grace because he gives it. It's a gift. The word forgiveness has the word give in it. Have you ever noticed that? He gives. And let's look at some practical things about forgiveness. Number one, God values you. When God gives you forgiveness, it's because he values you. And when you forgive somebody else, you give them value. You say, I care about you. You matter. Number two, be honest with yourself. You don't need to minimize. If somebody hurts you, it's okay to say that was hurtful or that was painful. It's okay for you to even recognize that. Don't minimize what someone has done to you. Maybe you were hurt as a child and you're sitting here trying to make excuses for the person who hurt you. You don't need to make excuses for them. Sometimes you need to say that was really bad. But I can forgive. Number three, forgiveness does not mean instant trust. Young married people sitting over here that I'm looking at right now, you need to understand something very early in your marriage. Just because someone forgives you doesn't mean that instantly everything is just the way it was. When you do something dumb, you have to earn trust. And I will tell you one of the things I've learned over the years, addicts love to use forgiving people and use that against them to say, you should do whatever I want in order for them to get a fix. You should, oh, you should forgive me for what I did yesterday and give me more money today. Trust me, I won't spend it on drugs or alcohol. Don't worry, you know. And then you say, no, I'm not giving it to you. And they say, well, I thought you forgave me. And you say, I forgive you, but I don't trust you. And that's okay. And that's okay. Forgiveness and trust are two different things. Number four, forgiveness is not always a one-time thing. This is a huge deal. Listen. Sometimes if somebody has hurt you, if you're not careful, you'll forgive them. Forgiveness is a choice. You'll choose to forgive them, and then you'll wake up the next day, and you'll be rehashing it again. And you'll have to say, God, I choose to forgive them. By the way, forgiveness is also a gift given to Christians through the Holy Spirit for you then to give to others. We're not capable of forgiveness by ourselves. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Unforgiveness causes us to focus on a person's flaws and become bitter. I learned this when I taught school. There'd be a kid who would begin to act up, and I would find myself then noticing every single thing that child did and becoming irritated with that child. I've seen parents do that to children. I'll never forget when I first went into youth ministry. I remember a parent that had two children, and one child, no matter what they did, it was wrong. Why was that? Because the parent got hyper-focused on that child's deficits, and then anything they did, they just boom, boom. And by the way, if you've ever had a boss like that, it is a miserable, horrible feeling to have somebody sit and focus on all your flaws. (laughs) Don't justify hurting others or being hurt. 
When you're apologizing to somebody, don't say, well, if you had only... That's not an apology. If somebody hurts you, don't, you don't have to make an excuse for them either. Well, if I hadn't done this, they probably wouldn't have done it. Listen, people do that when it comes to childhood things all the time. Well, if I hadn't done this, then maybe they wouldn't have. Don't justify that behavior. Number next, we all need forgiveness. I've only had one time that I've had to tell, convince somebody of that. We all, need, we all mess up. We all mess up. If you've ever messed up, would you just raise your hand? Eric, I've messed up. I've blown it. I've sinned. I've done something dumb. Okay, if they're not raising your hand and they're your spouse, you are welcome to hit them right now <laughs> and remind them. Now, the truth is, we don't have to be reminded. We know that we've all failed. The Bible says we've all fallen short of God. But here's what's awesome. When you receive his love and forgiveness, he gives you a clean slate. He instantly forgives you. He instantly loves you. He forgives. And we all need his forgiveness. And then finally, last but not least, forgiveness is a gift. It's given, not earned. That's what grace is. Grace says, God, I can't earn my way to you. Every religion in the world, except for Christianity, says that you need to somehow earn your way to God. You need to light a candle. You need to count some beads. You need to, to, to pray to an idol. You need to do a bunch of certain things, and then you'll measure up to God. Christianity says Jesus came and paid for you. It's by grace you're saved through faith, not by works, so that nobody can brag about it. Nobody can brag about it. Nobody can say, I'm a little better than you. We're all under grace and we say, God, I need your forgiveness. Number two, if you're going to walk in forgiveness, you have to forgive yourself and others. Over the years, I've met so many people who can't forgive themselves for something dumb they did, a dumb choice they made, something horrible that they did. Listen, you can receive forgiveness for you because that first thing you received God's forgiveness. But let me tell you something I've learned. And guys, you're worse about this than women. You know what this is called? What's this called? Tupperware. Tupperware. We call it Tupperware, even if it's not Tupperware. Did you know that? Anyway, so we call this Tupperware. This is not actual Tupperware. Although my sister Kelly, with 10 children, does sell Tupperware. That's an advertisement. Kelly, you owe me. All right. So, um, but Tupperware is awesome because what? You can put a meatloaf in here and you can put it in your refrigerator and forget all about it. Six months later, you look in your refrigerator and in the back, you see a science experiment. You, you have grown penicillin and seven viruses all in one Petri dish, right? So you look back there and what do you do? You take it and if you're like me, you think, okay, how much does Tupperware cost? Is it worth? Ah! Right? Is it worth that? Ah! Butter parquet. Is it worth? Is it worth opening this or just chunking it? Okay? Now here's the application. You ready? A lot of us think that unforgiveness is just that one thing in our life, that one person that we can't stand, that one person that hurt us years ago, and we think it's Tupperware or a sandwich bag, and we just seal that off. And it won't impact us. Here's the problem. Your life is not Tupperware. There are no lids. There is no sealed bag. When you put it in the refrigerator, it's like throwing that onion in the refrigerator. You're going to find it soon enough. You're going to know it was there. Unforgiveness is the same way. Bitterness will build up. Things will build up in your life. And you have, you have to say, God, would you help me? To forgive, not just because of the benefit to me, but because you have said that. Listen to what it says here. If your fellow believer sins against you, go and tell him in private. So when somebody messes up, you really should, it's about relationships. You want to talk to them in private what he did wrong. If he listens to you, you've helped that person be your brother or sister again. But if he refuses to listen, go to him again. Take one or two people with you. Every case may be proved by two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell the church. If he refuses to listen to the church, treat him like a person who does not believe in God, like a tax collector. We have a tax collector in our service, so we're going to treat him like we treat you. So, so here's the deal. So the Bible says when it has to do with Christians, you go to them privately. If they won't listen to you, you go and you take somebody with you. If they still won't listen to you, you take them to the church. Basically, in our church, you talk to the pastor and say, hey, listen, we got this deal going on. This is what's happening. If they won't listen to the pastor, the Bible says, then, if they won't listen to the church, then what do you do? 
You treat them like a tax collector, a sinner. So there's some denominations that they think that means that you shun them. Let me ask you a question. How did Jesus treat tax collectors? He went to dinner with them. He went to dinner with them, exactly. You must have been at the service last night. <laughs> he went to dinner with them. Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and says, I'll go to dinner with you. Now, he didn't put, G- he didn't put Zacchaeus in charge. He did not tell Zacchaeus, oh, I'm going to listen to your advice. And he didn't pretend that Zacchaeus was some type of follower of Christ. He treated him like a tech. He loved him and he cared about him, but he didn't treat him as a believer. That's what this verse is talking about. It's saying, hey, if they're in leadership, don't let them be in leadership. Don't let them be in a position where they pretend to be a Christian when they really don't act like a believer. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you love to be corrected? You love it. I mean, you, you can't wait for those evaluations at work where that boss comes. Years ago, this has happened twice. I've been in ministry 20, almost 21 years now, full time. And two different times I've had men, when I first come to a church, it's always been a man, who've come to me. The first one, I'll never forget the first one. The first one's my favorite. This guy came to me and he goes, Eric, I want you to know something. I'm at this church in order to correct other people. God has given me the task of basically what he said was keeping the church straight. Now, I didn't know what to think about that. I was 20-something years old in ministry, and I'm thinking, oh, okay. Let me tell you what I learned very quickly. God has a name for those people. Jerks. <laughs> they call themselves prophets. They call themselves all kinds of things. But the truth is, what they think is that their job is to be the Holy Spirit and correct everybody around them because they have a, <laughs> they're a little superior to other people. Listen, the Bible says when you correct people, you have to really evaluate yourself because you might fall into the same thing. If you look forward to correcting somebody, you have the wrong attitude. You're looking for vengeance and not forgiveness. You're not looking for restoration. You're looking for something else. Listen, make sure that if you're going to correct somebody that you pray, that you ask God to show you. It should be done with a humble heart. It shouldn't be because you know how things are supposed to be. <laughs> And if you hear somebody say that, run. Run from those people. Run from those people. When you see that type of pride and arrogance, run from them. Because listen, nobody likes to be corrected. As soon as we get corrected, you know what we do? We hire our inner lawyer. Well, I don't, they don't know what they're talking about. I can't believe they would correct me. Besides, they shouldn't correct me. I Listen. Make sure that you're sensitive when somebody does correct you. Make sure you're sensitive and saying, God, is anything that they're saying to me true? Is it right? Is it honest? In Matthew 6, I do not like this verse. I'd like to take this out of my Bible. Matthew 6. But if you forgive people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your fathers will not forgive your sins. Jesus says, if you don't forgive other people, how can I forgive you? So we need to pray and say, Holy Spirit, I need your help forgiving somebody. Holy Spirit, I need your, I don't want to forgive them. They don't deserve it. And God reminds us, you don't deserve it either. And we say, well, God, help me forgive. Is there anyone you've not forgiven? Have you forgiven yourself? That's the next prayer step. Number three, ask forgiveness. Ask forgiveness. Now let me give you one caveat that I've learned don't apologize to somebody. For example, let's say you've been mad at me. Let's say Al's been my friend for years. So let's say Al has, is in church today and Al thinks, you know, I've hated Eric for the last three years. I've been sitting here in church smiling at him, but I really hate his guts. I've been, you know, I've been back here and I'm thinking, Eric, I hate you. So Al gets convicted of that. So he comes to me and he says, Eric, I want you to know something. Even though we've gone to lunch, even though uh, uh, we've been friends and, and been out and we've talked and, and, and uh done things together. I want you to know something. For the last three years, I've hated your guts. Al feels a lot better at that point. I feel horrible. Because I had no idea. Right? Be careful when you're asking forgiveness that you're not asking something that the person is totally unaware of and you're actually just trying to relieve your conscience and you end up hurting the other person. Don't go to somebody, I think AA says it really well, don't go to somebody to ask if it hurts the other person. Be sensitive to that. 
Matthew 5 says it this way. If you're offering your gift at the altar, remember that your brother or your sister, remember this is primarily a church thing, has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, go and be reconciled to them, and then come and offer your gift. You don't always have that choice. You can't always make right something right with someone else, but you can forgive them. And you can forgive you. And if you've done something dumb in the past, you can say, God, I receive your forgiveness. In Luke 6, 31, it says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Corrie Ten Boone lived in Holland. She taught special needs kids. Her dad owned a watch shop. Her sisters and her family all worked with them. When the Germans came to Holland, the Boone family hid Jews from the Germans. They fed them. They took care of them. They had an upper room where they hid them in a secret place. The German government eventually figured out they were hiding people. They couldn't figure out where they were hiding them or how they were helping them, but they figured it out. And so they were all rounded up, and they were all taken to a concentration camp. When they got there, Corey was immediately separated from her parents, and I think it was one of her uncles. Her and her sister, as they walked off, saw her parents be sent to the gas chamber and killed. They lived, I forgot how long, in the concentration camp, but while there, her sister died. She was accidentally released from the concentration camp from a paperwork error. After World War II, Corrie Ten Boom, after returning to Holland, after World War II, she returned to Germany to teach about forgiveness. And so she went church to church talking about God's forgiveness, how he forgives us, how we have to forgive other people, how our sins are buried as deep as the deepest sea. When we ask for forgiveness. At the end of one of her meetings, a German officer began to walk up to her. And as she looked at him, she realized that he was one of the officers at the concentration camp. In some stories, it says that she actually knew that he was one that sent her family to the gas chambers. But I don't know if that part is accurate or not. But she knew it was somebody at Ravensbrück. Somebody she had dealt with in the concentration camp. And he came up to her, and here's what he said. He said, thank you so much for talking about forgiveness. I became a Christian not too long ago, and I've really struggled with all the things that I've done and all the bad things that I've done, and I just wanted to personally ask you for your forgiveness. And he stuck his hand out to Corey Ten Boom. Corey Ten Boom said, at that point, she acted like she needed to get something out of her purse, and she looked over and started rummaging through her purse and praying. And she said, God... I can't forgive this man. I can't take his hand. But I need your strength. Holy Spirit, would you give me the strength? I can't even lift my arm. And she said instantly she felt God's power and she reached her hand out and she shook the man's hand who had been her captor and her torturer. She said, I forgive you. Only through God's power could she forgive somebody who had done something so evil. Listen, I know many of you have been mistreated, you've been hurt, you've had people do things to you. Some of you have done terrible things. You've done terrible things to other people and you think, I can't receive God's forgiveness, I've got to earn it back. Let me tell you something. If you want to have God's joy again, if you want to live in peace, you have to forgive and you have to receive his forgiveness. The final step today is this. This comes from AA, or also from Southern Recovery. Evaluate all my relationships. Make amends for anything you've done to others, except when to do so would harm them or others. And if you're here today, here's the biggest deal. If you're here today and you've never received God's forgiveness, you know about Jesus, maybe you've come to church, maybe you went to church as a child, maybe you were baptized as an infant, maybe you were baptized even as a child, but you've never surrendered your life to him. You've never said, Jesus, I want to allow you into my life. I want to give my life to you. I receive your forgiveness. Today, before you leave, you can do that. And I'd love to talk to you about what it means to give your life to Christ. Maybe you're here today and you've been a Christian for years, but you've struggled. You've thought that that unforgiveness was Tupperware. But trust me, the people close to you know it's not. And it's time to forgive. It's time to receive forgiveness, and it's time to give forgiveness. And that's only possible through the power of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it. I can't do it. I don't even like this sermon. 
I don't want to talk about forgiveness. It's hard. But you know what? I realize what God's done for me. And I realize that because of what he's done for me, I have to forgive other people and I have to forgive myself for my own stupidity. And then I also have to say, God, is there anybody that I need to ask forgiveness of? And then go out of my way to do that. Let's end today in prayer. Would you join me? Father, thank you so much for today. I thank you, first of all, for your forgiveness. I thank you that the gospel means good news, that you have poured your forgiveness on us. But Lord, honestly, it's so hard to forgive other people sometimes. Sometimes it's hard to forgive ourselves for our stupidity. But Lord, because you've forgiven us, we receive your forgiveness. And I pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us the power to not only be forgiven and sense your